Um, today, we're very lucky to have the uh, brilliant Charles Hood, um, who's going to talk to us about um, blue sharks around Cornwall and his, his experience of trying to, to track them down and, um, and, and swim with them. Um, so, without further ado, um, Charles, are you able to share your screen? Yes, hopefully. Can, I, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we'll go on to share screen. Uh, Does that come through okay? Yes. Right. Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Shark Month, meet the experts. I'm going to be talking about um, Cornish blues or really a uh, migration path on how we found them because it wasn't that easy. Um, and it all started quite a long time ago. But first, here's a, sh here's a short clip. Sorry, that might have come across a bit louder than I thought it did, but that was the first clip of a blue shark we saw about uh, six, seven years ago now. And just to give you a feel of, of what's out there. But a bit about myself first. Um, I'm a, those who don't know me, I was a diving phone journalist since 2001, working for a dive magazine. Um, traveling around the world taking photographs of exotic locations and also leading uh, shark diving trips. Uh, I'm a commercial diver and underwater photographer. Um, I've been doing underwater photography since the early 80s um, but gradually uh, small people have been taking photographs. Um, I've switched to shark, shark tourism and also bringing shark tourism to Cornwall because it's something we can do um, right off our coast. So I now run marine and shark snorkeling trips, and you can find me on Facebook under the uh, under those uh, tags below. But it all started years ago in a place called Catalina, which is an island off uh, San Diego in, in America. And it used to be known as a sort of gambling paradise where everybody went uh, for the weekends. But gradually it got known for um, blue sharks. And we really had no idea, to be honest, what we were doing in those days. This is a later boat. I haven't got any pictures of the early boat. But we hired a fishing boat. Essentially, this is a fishing boat um, who went out, who used to go out and catch blue sharks. And he kind of got a cage from somebody he knew. And when we turned up, he'd actually never done this before. So it was very much on our own. He'd been out fishing for blue sharks, but he hadn't actually put divers in the water. But anyway, we set off uh, with this boat and uh, his chum, a uh, mackerel, and they proceeded to chop this mackerel up and chuck it over the side, just as though they were going shark fishing. Um, and then uh, we got to the location and we chucked the shark cage out and attached it to the, to the boat on a length of a rope. And the, the idea was is that we'd go in uh, into the cage as a safety mechanism. But there was a flaw in the plan because uh, the first flaw was we had to swim to the cage with all the sharks around um, and that didn't give us very much protection. Uh, and the second flaw was when we went in there, the cage would bounce up and down. It's nothing like you see in Jaws and things like that. The cage was bouncing up and down, throwing us around all over the place and, and we all just got seasick. So um, we just abandoned the cage idea. And this is sort of... Uh, back in the 80s when, when sharks were sort of villains and it was very much jewels was sort of around and blue water, white death that the tailors did. So, you know, sharks are sort of dangerous animals that just killed any man that went into the ocean. But eventually they came round and uh, just as the fishermen said they would do. And so there's only one thing to do and that was to uh, just get in the water. So uh, I volunteered to go in as, as first one in. Uh, just to see what would happen. We had no idea what was going to happen, absolutely no idea at all. Um, and what happened was, was surprising. They actually came very, very close indeed. They weren't aggressive. Um, so I was in the water, that's me with the, with the camera, and there's a guy behind me acting as a safety diver. 
Um, and the problem was is that we came so close that uh, we couldn't photograph them. They were literally just, uh, just right on the lens all the time. But anyway, eventually we sort of worked out a pattern that if you swam backwards, um, they would sort of follow you a bit like a puppy dog. And that gave us a bit of distance um, between the shark uh, and the diver. And so we started to get some nice shots where the shark was actually coming straight towards the camera. And uh, these are the kind of pictures that we were getting. Um, and this is sort of in the 80s, and people were just um, gobsmacked, really. We weren't the first people doing it, but we certainly were among that group of people um, trying to get pictures. And when I brought these back to the UK, um, magazines loved them. They were on, on, on the pages of a lot of magazines and featured in a lot of wildlife um, publications. But it's purely because uh, sharks were very much in vogue at, at that time. We did. Um, discover one thing though that they can be very inquisitive with ponytails this is a friend of mine who had a ponytail and the ponytail was sort of swishing around the back of the head and the shark went for it so obviously couldn't bite the hair but uh, it gave us a nasty shock so it sort of did instill this sort of um if you like atomistic fear of sharks even though it's, it was totally irrational so back in cornwall um i bought a boat and thought let's try and do some shark tourism uh, in Cornwall. Uh, and that's it, that's with Logan, I've got it still today uh, and it's one we use uh, when we go out and we first start off with basking sharks, the reason why basking sharks are very plentiful around the place and uh, sadly they, they sort of declined but now they've come back um, and they were easy to find because they're quite big animals although we thought um, we identified them by the, the fins. Um, each shark has a unique fin pattern, especially on the, the leading edge of the dorsal fin. And some tragically have, have had suffered injury. And, and this one that's obviously uh, been hit by a propeller or something similar. Um, but it seems to have healed and the shark was swimming quite happily. There's one with a sort of raggy tail, um, just off Logan's Rock. And sometimes they, they hide, sometimes they just skim the surface and you can only just see the tip of the fin. Um, and it makes them a lot harder to spot, especially in, in, in duller conditions. Um, um, unfortunately, people used to follow me out because I got known as being able to find the sharks and a lot of um, other boats started to join me. This is uh, an operator that started up and he hasn't got a clue where it is. Um, we were just sitting a couple of hundred yards away, letting him sort of potter around and the shark if you if you just spot it it's right behind them so they're all looking in completely the opposite direction and this is what often happens they, they, they can be sneaky sneaky sharks to find but we did see quite a few uh, on one day uh, this was uh, September in 2007 and um, we had about uh, there's, there's about six or seven in the picture there but we had about 400 um, some reports are saying up to 800 but I always like to halve things, so there were definitely around, uh, around four. We saw at least a hundred, at least. Um, and Duncan, a friend of mine who was in Penzance, said he saw exactly the same thing, and he was about five miles away. That's how many sharks were around. Um, sometimes they come very close in. This is just off Porth Chapel. And when we're swimming with them, we always try and stay one, one side and one the other side, so the shark can swim quite happily in between there and you're not forcing it into uh, any, any situation where it feels trapped. And there's one in Porth Kerno, a baby just below the Mimic Theatre. And these are some of the pictures we got. And, and this was the early 2000s when we were promoting the, uh, the basking sharks and they're starting to get known um, sort of throughout the UK. But before that, it was sort of the odd fishermen had reported them, but nothing was really sort of cited in the press. And these are some pictures. That's a, a guy swimming with it, just to sort of give you a sense of scale, how big these are. The biggest one we saw was about nine meters, um, which is about approaching 30 feet. Uh, we know that because it was longer, longer than the boat. And that, the, the boat's quite a good measuring stick. And this is a this is the time when we've got loads in Senan, and that's three in the picture. It's quite hard to do because the water is often a bit murky when you see them.
Okay, I'll just stop that there because we haven't got too long. Um, but that was a basking shark, a little clip of a video of a basking shark just below, um, just below Land's End in one of the little coves there. They, they tend to like these little coves where the plankton congregates. And we had many film crews wanted to come on the boat. You know, everybody recognised Steve Batchel. This is one of the early programmes, Deadly 60. I don't know why they thought the Barsky shot was deadly, but um, it, it got on to the Deadly 60 programmes. And then this was Britain's Secret, Secret Seas um, with uh, Paul and Tooney and Frank, um, which was great. I and mean, when we had two, two of them non-stop, and we got uh, lots and lots of footage of them. Um, Spring, I'm talking about, um, we've had some big plagues of these over the last couple of years. They're rise of stone and jellyfish. Um, they're huge. Um, gives you some scale. That's my son, who's six foot five, um, to give you an idea of the size. And they were in Mance Bay for the last three or four years. We've had um, thousands, thousands, if not uh, millions of them. Uh, it's not an exaggeration. Any, any way you went, you could see them. Um, and that's one just across there from the mount. You could almost, you can see there's one in the background there as well on the left. That's how many of them there were. And this year we filmed with uh, Spring Watch because they were back again and they literally rang up. And I said, you know, they said, how are, difficult are they to find? I said, well, they're very easy. You know, 100 yards out of the harbour and you're going to see them. So this is filming Spring Watch and that was uh, a great little clip for advertising on its tourism. We also get some nastier creatures. Um, we got a lot of these this year, some Portuguese men of war. Um, this was floating quite a way offshore. And they're a sort of collection of animals. They're not really a jellyfish. They look like a jellyfish. And they're pretty deadly. And this is what they look like underneath. They're actually exquisite. Amazing uh, blue, iridescent blue colour and purple on the top. And these tentacles travel for about six or seven metres, and that's what stings you, it's the tentacles uh, that sting you. We also get dolphins, we've had a huge amount of dolphins the last couple of years. Um, trying to film it is very big, they, they don't like it when the boat stops, so you have to film when the boat's going, and it's quite difficult holding a, a camera underwater, but that gives you an idea of what they look like under the water. Um, Here's a little clip, hopefully, from the air. Okay, so that's dolphins. We had, uh, and all the other marine life we can find off the Cornish coast. But what really uh, attracted my attention uh, about five or six years ago was when we went to uh, California and all the blue sharks had gone. We saw three small blue sharks and two small makos in a whole week of diving, um, which is really sad because you don't associate America with fishing sharks, but they do. They fished a lot of them out. Um, but the guy said, well, you could do it in Cornwall. He said, there's no difference um, in the water and they're bound to be around. So this is what we did. And we decided to go out um, with the rib and do exactly what they did. And uh, with huge amounts of chum, massive buckets and everything else. And we didn't see a shark. We didn't see anything at all. And this happened quite a lot. Uh, and we got sort of quite disappointed, really. And then I spoke to a local uh, angler in and the secret was Okay, that was one of the first trips, commercial trips we did um, back in 2014. 
Um, and the secret he, he, he told me was instead of laying large amounts of chum that the Americans do is to have a very small amount of chum but incredibly concentrated. And this is what it looks like. It's a bucket, 60 kilo bucket full of sardine um, discards. What they do is they, they uh, slice and fillet the sardines and I get the heads, the frames, the tails and the guts. And that all gets mashed up and left for a couple of days in the sun. Then you add some bran to it and some pilchard oil and leave it for another couple of days in the sun until it starts to ferment and bubble and go absolutely horrible. And that's what they love. And we used to use it when I call live. We used to use it just like that and spoon it over the side of the boat. But everybody got seasick. Absolutely everybody was seasick instantly. And so now we freeze it in big containers. Um, which actually works better because the container can get chucked into the bucket and slowly um, thaws and dissolves and the scent sort of um, goes down. And it means only half the people are seasick. Um, so the day often starts like this. Um, this is a group of gannets diving on sardines and you'll see some dolphins and tuna. And this is what we look for. Um, this is inshore, which is not ideal, but underneath the early sharks, sharks um, scavenge all the sardines that are injured and not completely killed at the time. Um, so ideally you want to find these offshore because the sharks are offshore, not inshore. But this is generally what it looks like. And it's almost like something out of the sardine run in South Africa. And this happens every summer. And, and you can see where that is. That's about a mile off Lamorna. So it's not too far. For anybody to be able to see. Oh, I was uh, then we um, track. So I'm just going to let sorry. you. Know, sorry, the connection's quite slow, so some of your videos aren't coming through that well. Um, but I just wanted to let everybody know that it's not any one person's in particular. It's that the connection is it's not great. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Good old BT. Um. So, how we started off was putting a bit of fish on a rope on a buoy and throwing it out and then pulling the shark in sort of luring it in and not really feeding it because we don't really want to feed them too much um and it's amazing it's like a bit like teasing a kitten or a cat and they'll just keep going round and round and round and this way you get them used to the boat because that's what we want to to try and achieve it's really easy to see them it's very difficult to get them used to the boat um, and be able to come close enough so you can photograph them but we persevered and persevered. And uh, first of all, we didn't really know what to do. Um, we'd swum with them in California, but we didn't know if the English sharks were, were gonna be any different. Um, so this is what we started doing is uh, putting the camera overboard. This was the Shark Bay films of Porth Levin. And we had some successes, but as you can see, um, as similar to in Santiago, they are very, very inquisitive and they will come straight up and bite anything they think could be tasty. And this is biting the, the camera lens. And that's one having a go at a GoPro. They love GoPros. They love anything um, small and shiny or anything made out of plastic. Um, but you can see they're not really aggressive. They're just testing to see uh, if it's edible. They also love the boat. Um, that's the boat to be patched up with a small leak. And you can see the little teeth mark, those little zigzaggy things are where the shark hit the boat. So we now have a mat down the side of the boat to stop that happening. Um, and you can just see how inquisitive they are, and because of their inquisitive sort of looking straight into the lens, and these are some early pictures, where we got them swimming right by the camera. And you get this beautiful colour. Sometimes they look a bit grey, but uh, the best way to see them is when you get the reflection in the water, and you can see the purple iridescence. Um, color of them. That's the first thing everybody says. I didn't realize how blue they were when they see them. Um, and that's a split level one uh, at dusk. We we're trying to get the sun set, but unfortunately, the sun was sort of to one side a bit and it didn't really work. 
then we had to get in with them. So I decided to go in. Um, I'm always the person that decides to go in. Um, and in actual fact, they weren't that positive. They would just sort of swim around the boat and completely ignore me, really. The pole I had was had a GoPro on it, so I could film them at length and from underneath and everything else. But in actual fact, in the end, um, it wasn't needed. You could just film um, with a handheld camera. I'd sort of flash there saying it was a slow connection, so hopefully everybody can hear me. And that's what it generally looks like from the air. Um, there's people holding onto the boat, there's sharks underneath, there's sharks to the side, there's sharks um, by the boat, and sometimes it can be a bit chaotic, there's, there's, there's sharks everywhere. This one just quite happily cruising around the boat, and it just shows you what, uh, what they're like and how sort of, if you like, docile they are. They're not really aggressive. Um, we had about half a dozen around at this time and you just got to watch out for where they're coming from because uh, they can sometimes take you a bit by surprise that's on a typical sunday outing in Cornwall in the summer right so this is um some pictures of people taking photographs of them and you can see it's quite easy to to get in the water and get them quite close up to the uh, to the camera Uh, a lot of people say, are they safe? <laughs> yeah, they're safe. This is my daughter um, with a nice six foot female. And this is typically what they do is they come up and they just give you a little nudge and you can give them a gentle push away. And they're just sort of testing to see if you're fish or not. Um, but there you can see it's, in my view, it's perfectly safe. Um, get some big ones and uh, last year especially, we didn't have as many as the previous year, but we had some much, much bigger ones. This is about a seven, seven and a half footer. And it does start to get a bit interesting when they get to this big because they, they could give you a nasty bite um, if they wanted to. We insist that everybody has um, gloves on, uh, dark gloves and hoods, and uh, it's completely covered. Uh, and this way the shark won't mistake anything shiny as your fingers. Um, also, if, if you did get a little nick, it would protect you a bit um, because we found that when they bite something they don't like, they let go straight away, like, like you saw with the GoPro. This is the biggest shot to date we've had. Um, now we got a, this is a still from a video and we managed to get the shark length along the side of the boat. And when we came back, we measured the boat and it was just over nine foot which is a very big shark indeed. It's, um, to give you an idea, it's probably approaching the, 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 the British angling record in the UK, I think is just over nine foot. So that's a rare sight and a lovely uh, sight to see. It did uh, give me the, the, uh, a bit of the heebie-jeebies though, because that is a big shark. And you can see that guy is well over six foot um, who's, who's photographing it. But a great, great sight to see. And, Last year, for the first time ever, we saw a poor beagle, um, which is great something because these are critically endangered sharks, and we had one swim right up to the boat. That's it. You can immediately tell it's different. It's got a pointy nose and tuna tail, and the pectoral fins are, are much small, smaller, and they're very, very quick indeed. Um, this is only a baby. It's about five foot, and uh, I think there's a tiny... You can see how different they swim really really quickly around very very quickly um, compared with the blue so that was a great sight to see um, and hopefully this year if we can get out we're going to try and go a bit further offshore and see if we can see a few more of them um, yes we've had lots of people on the boat this was the one show Miranda had been trying for five years to see the blue sharks and we got her in um, with them uh, who else do we have? This is Naomi Campbell of the uh, Wild Show. It's a bit like a kid's grown up Blue Peter, and her challenge was to swim the blue sharks. She was absolutely terrified. It was her phobia, and we got her in the water. Although I had to go in and hold her hand, and she was generally shaking. She was absolutely terrified. But we got pictures of her with blue sharks, which is great. And this is Awesome Watch, taken last year. 
um, with Gillian Burke uh, filming the Blue Sharks, and we've got uh, a great day out with Gillian. Um, then that was on Spring Watch um, in October. Um, so finally, I think we're about 30 minutes in, um, I'm going to show a, a few photographs that I particularly enjoy. Um, this is one bobbing up at the surface, trying to see uh, where the bait is. And these are some nice shots that shows you just how blue they are. And it's uh, on a lovely calm day we got last year. Uh, when you can sort of get the, these iridescent blue colours that sort of go from the sea to the shark to the surface. Um, they do like the capellas. I put this one in just to show you they love anything white and shiny. And if it's got um, electricity flowing through it, even better. And this is a shark and they, they often hang around the engines. I say to people, if you want to photograph them, just hang around the engines because that's where they'll be. This is a nice one showing the, the, the blue, sort of almost lavender uh, colour of the shark. Uh, this one's chasing the mackerel as, as we're pulling it in. Um, and this one was in the British Wildlife Photographer of the Year two years ago. They really liked that sort of mixture of sharks. Um, and that was the marine section on a prize. Um, and sometimes on you get this, as I was saying before, this is how you really see the colour when it reflects in, in the surface of the water. And that's looking straight down, that's just how blue they are. It's very, very difficult to get that colour um, because they often go grey. But sometimes if the, if the light is in exactly the right spot, they just shine this, this iridescent blue colour, hence their name, I guess. And then not last year before, we had a greatest number. Um, and it was absolute chaos. We were using up some bait, a bit more bait than we had because it was the end of the season. It was late September. And there we, we got in excess of 30 sharks. So too many to count. Um, there were 17. If you look really, really close in that shot, there's 17. But don't forget, there's the same amount behind me on either side. There were just sharks literally everywhere in the water. And most people who look at that, they go, oh, is that in French Polynesia or, you know, the Bahamas or something like that? And they just can't believe it's um, in Cornish waters, just literally 10 miles off our shore. And a selfie. We, we, uh, we had to do a selfie. We had to try a selfie. One of the hardest things to do because you don't really, you can't see where the sharks are and where the camera's pointing. So you just have to keep pointing and hope and shooting and hoping um, it's in the right direction. And that's me with um, a couple of sharks last year. So before I wind up, um, I am a chairman of the Shark Trust and a little plea goes out that blue sharks are endangered. They're not critically endangered, but they are endangered. And that is because there is no fishing limits on it whatsoever. You can catch as many blue sharks as you can. There are no quotas and they're often uh, caught in bycatch with the tuna industry. And so the Shark Trust is trying very heavily to get at least quotas, because if we can get a quota, then we can get some idea of how many sharks are being caught and the scale of the problem, if there is a problem. But we do need that in. So if anybody's looking to sponsor or to join a charity or to buy gifts, um, you can adopt a shark and things like that. Join, to the, join the Shark Trust or go to the Shark Trust website. And they've also got loads of information about sharks and all sharks around the world. And... Um, it's a good thing to do when kids are off, uh, off at home. Good thing to do. There's lots of little games and quizzes uh, they can find to do on the, on the, on the website. So, uh, I think questions, that's about half an hour. We've probably got about 10 minutes, have we, Jax? Uh, a little bit less. We've got six minutes and 40 seconds. Six um, thank you so much for that, Charles. It was brilliant as always and absolutely beautiful images. I'm sorry that the... Um, videos didn't work quite as well as, as we'd have liked. Um, so we've got quite a few questions, so I'm going to pick out some of them I think you've kind of answered as you've gone on anyway. Um, so a question from Tillian McKenzie, how hard is it to spot sharks in Cornwall? The basking sharks are seen, you can often see from the cliffs, um, just look for the black uh, dorsal fin and often the tail, good pair of binoculars you could do. Um, the blues, it's very easy. You've just got to wait. You've just got to go out there and put some chum in the water and wait. And yes, they pop up right by the boat, but it's, it's a waiting game with them. And other sharks, um, it's much more difficult, I think, unless you're diving. You, you obviously see, see some cat sharks and things like that. 
Um, Archie, age seven, has asked, can the blue sharks eat a human? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's unlikely because you're not their normal food. Uh, and if they did bite you, they'd probably leave you alone. But technically, I suppose if you chopped a human up and chucked it overboard, they would probably eat it. Yes, they, they'll eat dead dolphins and carrion and things like that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Gruesome question. <laughs> I think we had that question. I think there's only about, there's two records of them actually biting people, um, but they were when they were being fished, I think. Um, mm. Marta has asked, how do you photograph the Portuguese man of war if it's so poisonous? Uh, it's, yeah, it's not poisonous, it stings, that's the thing, and it stings through the tentacles. So what you have to do is you have to try and approach um, the other side of the current. So the tentacles are going one side and the creature's on the other side and you wear gloves and hoods and things, a, a barrier across your face and just hope you don't get stung. But it's, it's imperative you are completely covered, a bit like the, uh, the virus situation at the moment. Yeah, they can be quite nasty. Mm. And um, uh, I'm not sure who the name is, but um, somebody's asked, do they ever get injured by the boat props? Um, I presume you mean the basking sharks. The blue, um, I think the blue, blue sharks, because they're so attractive. Oh, right. uh, no, because um, when we're um, photographing them on, on location, the angels are shut down. So uh, the boats are swabbing around, the engines are off, so the, 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 the props are still. The, um, what they're attracted to is the, the white, the white flashing um, of, the, of the propellers because they slightly spin and as a boat bobs around, they will slightly move. And also the engine is attached to the battery, that the little bolts coming out of the shots are incredibly sensitive. They will pick up the smallest and the tiniest bit of electricity. Um, even so, they can detect electricity in fish, that's how sensitive they are. Brilliant. Um, B has asked, what equipment do you use to photograph? Um, right, I use a bog standard Nikon camera. Um, it's an SLR that you can get in any, any shop and that's in a waterproof housing. It's a metal housing, um, a case if you like, that your camera goes inside and you can operate all the controls from outside and it's completely waterproof. And then we usually have a couple of flash guns on either side that are waterproof um, and all that lot can be taken on the water. Brilliant. Um, um, still got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to keep asking. Right. Questions. We've got loads coming through. Um, so, oh yeah, so somebody said that there's no fishing quota, which is shocking. Um, is uh, What's being done to change that? Right, so this is where I said to go to the shark trust because it's, it shocks a lot of people when they discover there's no quotas for blue sharks. And the shark trust are introducing a no limit campaign. If you go on there, there's lots of information about no limits. It's not only for blue sharks, it's for sharks around the world. They've been very successful last week in getting Canada to um, completely stop fishing uh, short fin mako sharks that are critically endangered. Um, unfortunately, Spain and Portugal still do, um, but they're fighting very hard to get the same thing done there. So they either fight for um, a complete ban where they're critically endangered, or if they're endangered like blue sharks, to get a quota under this no limits. And it's campaigning governments and NGOs. Um, that's how they get these um, quotas put in place. Brilliant, thank you. And when we upload this to YouTube, I'll put the link to the Shark Trust and the No Limits campaign there as well. Um, Thanks. A minute and a half left. I'm going to say there's two questions. Um, have you ever seen male blue sharks and at what depth do you generally find the blue sharks? Ah, right. Someone knows about blue sharks then. Um, majority of blue sharks we see are females. Um, they're not exactly sure why, but they think it's because they come to pup and uh, obviously give birth and to fatten up on the, the stocks of sardines and, and, and pilchards and mackerel and the, the males stay offshore but we have seen males we see about half a dozen a year that's an issue where we'd normally see about 200 to 250 females but then we see about half a dozen um, and we've seen them surface if they're deep we can't see them because we only snorkel with them so they're at the surface a bit like the pictures were showing um, if they're any deeper than about 10 metres, then we can't really see them because we, we, we snorkel with them. If you dive with them, they just go deep. They don't like the bubbles. That's why we snorkel with them. 
Um, so we ran out of time for questions um, during the talk, so Charles has very kindly offered to answer the questions um, separately for us. So I'll just run through, we had quite a lot of questions yesterday, um, so I'll run through the rest of them here. So there's two that are quite similar, we can answer together I think. So Catherine asked, how far out do you have to travel to come across the blue sharks? And Zoe asked, how close to the shore do these sharks come, i.e. how far out is it safe to swim without a wetsuit? Right, uh, good questions. Normally we travel between 10 and 15 miles, 20 miles offshore. So then really more oceanic and pelagic fish rather than inshore. Occasionally you will see them inshore, but it's very unlikely that you'll see them say within half a mile of the shore. So I think you're perfectly safe to swim. Cool. That's good to know. I swim without a wetsuit. <laughs> fairly close in. Yeah, very rarely. I think there was one in St. Ives, I think, uh, last year, but that's quite a random, random event, really. Sure. Um, and what is the success rate of finding the sharks? And that was from Luke Cooperberry. Right. Well, for the last three years, we plotted where we've seen them and we've seen them on every single trip. And this is a sort of combination of about five to seven years work, just plotting where we've seen them. And then we just go back out to the same area and that's generally proved successful. It's purely random. There's no underwater features or anything like that. It's just where we've seen them. And uh, when you start seeing them in a certain area, you just tend to go back there, but we see them on every trip now. Brilliant. Um, and um, so Beck Lotto asked, how many sharks are there when you film? Right, generally, I mean, obviously it depends. Sometimes you just get one, a uh, very curious one. Sometimes you can get up to 20, 30, but on average we see between five and 10 sharks per trip. Um, and you mentioned yesterday as well that obviously we can you can only see the ones that are close to the surface so do you think that there are more but further down yes and also it's it's difficult to know if you're seeing the same ones twice sometimes if there are a lot around um but usually the big ones stay down and it's sometimes when i'm on the, on the surface i think there's only say three or four in the water somebody gets in and they go oh there's another sort of four or five down below so I'm conservative with the, with the estimates we see, but often you're right, there are sharks below that I can't see. It's only when we put people in the water that we actually are much better count. Great, thank you. And um, um, oh, Vicky said, do you see more blue sharks on a particular coast of Cornwall? Um, well, I know that they should be found everywhere, and they're certainly on the north coast as well. Um, it's just we've found them uh, roughly off the southwest um, of Cornwall Island of Penzance, that's where we tend to find them. And certainly if we travel uh, towards the Lizard, you tend to see fewer of them. And conversely, if you travel towards the Cilias, you see fewer of them. So why they hang around in that little area, sort of off the southwest tip, I don't know. It's just we, we see them there, so we tend to go there. It would be really interesting to find out, wouldn't it? Um, well, they do see them, they do catch them out of loo, unfortunately, you know, that's where the fishing, uh, the angling site of Great Britain is based, so they do see them out of loo. Um, but yes, generally the southwest tip tends to be uh, where they congregate. Okay. Um, so Ian Dixon asked, how long are these encounters typically and do you wear wetsuits or dry suits? Um, we often wear wetsuits, wetsuits are far more comfortable to uh, swim around in, although you can wear a dry suit, it's really up to you. Um, it, the hardest thing is getting them towards the boat, that can usually take between, well five minutes is the record, but usually it's more like an hour to two hours um, to get them to come towards the boat. Once say we've got to at least two or three around as long as we're there. Um, they'll just literally hang around and 99% of the time we leave them behind. So how long do you spend on the boat? Is, that, is it, it's like a full day trip, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we normally leave around nine, get on, on station about 10. 
and then the chum goes in the water and then that's the waiting game. And sometimes it can be a couple of hours. But uh, once established, um, most people are too tired to carry on. We normally sort of leave them about four o'clock, something like that. And most people are just, they're just swum. You know, if they've been in the water for three hours, it's a long time swim. So uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we'll stay later. Sometimes the record is nine o'clock, we stay that. So. And uh, we saw it went dark, yes, yeah, so and we were, we were surrounded by dolphins at the end of the day as well. That was a great end of the day. What an amazing experience. <laughs> Sharks and dolphins all at once. Um, so Tamsin Nauman has asked, are you able to identify individuals and do you see the same ones more than once? Hello Tamsin. Oh, I know Tamsin. Um, we are sometimes, it really depends if we've got marks on them. Some of them, nearly all the small ones are very clean because they probably haven't made it yet. Once they've been through a breeding cycle, they'll have bite marks around them. And then this, you can pick them up. You know, some have got quite nasty scars, especially around the gills. Um, and you can, if you see them again, then obviously you'll, you'll recognize that pack. And a few have injuries, like a, a nick on the fin or a bite on the fin. We've had one without a pectoral fin completely, swimming around quite happily. Um, and obviously you can identify those, but on the whole it's quite difficult um, from day to day to identify them. So we have them, um, because we have a scheme to identify the, the dolphins, the resident dolphins in the southwest, the uh, bottlenose dolphins in the southwest, so there's no kind of scheme to try and identify the um, different kinds of different particular sharks. They've tried. We've had some people from Exeter on the boat, University. We've had some people from University of South Devon um, trying to do the same thing, photograph the dorsal fin. But it's quite small compared with a dolphin and, and say, a basking shark. And there are a lot of them. So the chance of seeing the same one twice, I think, is a lot smaller. Um, unlike dolphins, you know, where you've got a distinct pod sort of cruising around and the basking sharks, maybe only a couple of dozen. I reckon there's probably thousands of blue sharks out there in the summer. Cool. Awesome. Um, so Pippa Sandim has asked, what is the biggest thing blue sharks eat? Right. Often get asked what, what do blue sharks eat. They generally eat smaller things like squid and mackerel, but they will take carrion. And we've seen dolphins, uh, we've seen, sorry, we've seen blue sharks eating a dolphin, a dead dolphin. I mean, it had been dead for a while, I should say. They, don't, they wouldn't attack a live dolphin, but if a dolphin was um, bobbing on the surface, they would. And uh, a few years ago, they filmed blue sharks um, feeding on a whale off, off the south coast of Wales. So, yes, they will take carrion and certainly probably seals as well, anything like that floating around. Um, they're quite happy to eat. But generally, they'll eat smaller stuff but if if there's something around that they don't have to fight for <laughs> they can they'll go for that yes i think early on it, you know, i was, uh, showed you the pictures of the gannet diving and then they always will be sitting underneath that picking off injured sardines and things like that so they're generally lazy they'll scavenge for injured and uh, dying um, fish and, and carrion it, it saves a lot of energy you know if you don't have to chase something around uh, why? Why do it? Sure, that makes total sense, doesn't it? Um, so, on to some more sort of general shark questions. Um, Kathy King has asked, "How sharp are sharks' teeth?" How sharp are sharks' teeth? It depends on what you define as sharp, but think of it more as something like a bread knife rather than a razor. Okay, and what they do is they've got incredibly strong jaws. So they latch onto their prey and then they slice their head backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards like that and rip the flesh off. And that's what blue sharks do. We've seen that when they were eating, feeding on the dolphin. They would go in there and literally slice and slice and slice and spin around and tear the, the, the flesh off. Um, but they quite happy to go for a big blue shark. They are, they are pretty, pretty sharp. Um, you know, you, you would certainly come off second best. We've got, um, <clears throat> at the Wildlife Trust, we've been donated a couple of, a few different kinds of shark jaws and it's quite surprising how sharp, how sharp they feel when, when you're actually feeling the teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Henry, who's one of our regular um, attendees to our, to Jen's um, question and answer sessions, 
Henry's asking, how big are basking sharks? How big are basking sharks? When they are born, they are about one and three quarter meters, something like that, to two meters. And the ones we normally see are around five to eight meters. Occasionally you get a nine meter one. And I think the record is somewhere around uh, 11 meters. So although it's the second largest uh, the second largest shark in the world, it's only just the second largest shark to the whale shark. It's around 12 meters. So you can see we do have a very, very large fish in our waters. And there are some around at the moment. Yeah, there's Hello. loads of them. Out. <laughs> Hopefully soon, you'll be able to get out soon. But yeah, the, um, yeah. quite a few sightings of them, and they had the first sighting yesterday or today in the Isle of Man as well, so they're obviously moving up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, oh, so then we had one from Maggie Nielsen. He said it wasn't a sharp question as such, but um, I was on a trip, uh, Charles led in Catalina in 2004 and I've carried on diving with the dive buddy I met there, Karina, ever since and it was a fab holiday. We only saw, saw blue sharks fleetingly but we had a long dive with the Mako and saw some angel sharks and she just wondered if you remembered the trip. Yes, I do remember the trip very well. I still keep in contact with another chap called Hancock who was on the trip. Um, and I think I remember saying earlier on when we went to Catalina and we started to see fewer and fewer sharks. And that was, I think, one of the last trips we did um, because they'd overfished them. And yeah, we did see the, the angel sharks always there. We knew where to find them. Um, but the, certainly the, uh, the makos and the blues numbers were just were way down. And so that really was the impetus, that last trip, to, to try and find them in UK waters. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us yesterday and also to answer the questions today, Charles. And you've, you're donating your fee for this talk to the Sharks Trust. Um, so thank you very That's much right. for doing that as well. But yeah, it's great to, great to speak to you and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.